Peace was good. Uh, welcome to another hip hop album review. Um, this is part 159. That album that I will be reviewing today is Organized Confusion's debut album, self titled album, Organized Confusion, released in 1991. Um, as you can see, I'm rocking the Organized Confusion shirt. If you guys see my my um, older reviews, you guys know that I've, you've seen the shirt before. But um, if you guys are wondering where I got the shirt at, I got it back in 2010 at the uh, 10, uh, 15th year anniversary of, of Duck Down Records at the concert over there. Um, I, I saw it, they, I got it at the merch table and I had to get it, you know what I mean? Because I seen everybody else had the other stuff, but I thought this stood out out of everything. So, you know, and then like, it's not something you see every day. So I was like, let me get this shit right here. All right. So that's how I got the shirt. All right. Um, for those who know who, for those who don't know who Organized Confusion is, uh, they're a group from Southside Queens or South Jamaica Queens. Um, they got the start back in the mid, uh, back in the late '80s, um, 1987 to be to be exact. Um, when they first started, they went under a different name, and that name was simply Too Positive. Um, at the time, they were under the mentorship of Paul C, who was like a legendary hip hop producer. He was like a super producer at that time. Like, you know, he was up there with, like, you know, uh, Molly Maul and, you know, cats like that. Um, Paul C., he's worked with, um, you know, obviously Dunn. He's worked with uh, Main Source. He's worked with um, Eric B. and Rakim and countless others around that, around that time. Excuse me. Yeah, I had to mute it. Yeah, so, um, like I was saying before, um, you know, so Paul C, you know, legendary producer at that time. And then um, they sent their demo to Def Jam. And, you know, Russell Simmons, you know, got his hands on it. He sent it to, to the A&R. The A&R at the time was Bobito. I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with Bobito, of certain Bobito fame. Uh, at the time, this is before he became a radio host of um, WKCR. Um, he was the A&R at Def Jam, so he was the one that would like, kind of like be like the scout, you know, like going through demo tapes and things like that. And he got the, a hold of that demo tape. So he liked what he heard, obviously. And then, you know, he showed the tape to um, Russell Simmons. And, you know, Russell Simmons turned it down because I guess he felt they were, they were too abstract, too technical. Um, it was, it would be something that would go over people's heads and, you know, something that is you know something that's not uh appeasing that would be appeasing to the to pub to the public and stuff like that and he was kind of right about that but it was a blessing in disguise in a sense but you know it is what it is so you know i guess they met up with russell simmons at one time they had like a meeting and things like that he say he he likes who they are like they like he think they're dope but he just feels like it wouldn't fit his um I guess his his record label at the time, and um, he was like, "Yo, I like you guys, but you guys gotta change your name." Cause he was pretty much saying, "Simply Too Positive" is pretty whack. So they ended up, you know, brainstorming and things like that. So they went back home, you know, whatever, and they was hanging out. And one of his men, one of his friends, were pulling out records, and one of the rec the record they pulled out was. Um, it was from, from a funk band called Confusion, a, a, a funk band from the early 70s and stuff like that. And they had an album that came out back in 1973 called Organized. So that's where they got the name from, Organized Confusion. But how they did it was like, it was spelled organized, like kind of like this, organized. Then it said Confunction. So they changed that and just put Confusion. So, you know, so that way they won't like get any of like, I guess, Sue for like copyright infringement and stuff like that. So that's how they got the name from that. So they got the name from that. And the rest is history. Um, and that's how they formed. And, you know, unfortunately, Paul C, I guess, was working on the album. Uh, or they were like in the beginning stages of it or whatever. But then he ended up dying. He ended up dying, um, getting killed, got murdered. Uh, to this day, um, the, the, the murder has been solved, unfortunately, 
And then so, you know, them being destroyed of that, you know, they started working on some more material, just learning what, just doing what they learned from Paul C. And then eventually all that material ended up becoming this album right here, the debut album, all right? Uh, this album has three singles. Uh, the three singles are Fudge Pudge, Walk Into The Sun, and Who Stole My Last Piece Of Chicken. Those are the three singles of the album, all right? Uh, production is done by Organized Confusions themselves, which I fucking love. I love when artists make their own beats because like I said I said in the past, um, you you as an artist would know what would sound good to you, you know what I mean? Because sometimes a producer might not be able to capture what you, 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 you would it capture what you're looking for, if that makes sense, so. Um, so, like I said, those are the, the, the those are the producers, um, the singles, and now I'll show you what the CD looks like. All right, it's black CD right here. As you can see, pretty cool. You can see like the logo right there. All right, you see the back. You see Principal with the flower hat. You know, you got these. You see Farrell March right here, a very young fat, well I don't say fat, but chubby Farrell March. So you see him without the hat, so it's like, you know, he got dreadlocks, seen through it on Farrell March. Um, it's, it's funny because um, Farrell March said in an interview, um, that uh, an interview that I read um, a while back, but the reason why he got so chubby was because uh, back in the day he used to drink 40s, but then he would add a Kool-Aid to the, to the, um, to the 40s, so it's kind of like his homemade version of St. Ives and stuff like that, so that's how he got so chubby, so I thought that was pretty funny, alright, um, yeah, so open it up, see the back, pretty cool, open it up, see the credits, the shout outs and all that good stuff right here, alright, so you know how I get down, I'm gonna go through some of the tracks, Alright. <clears throat> Excuse me. First let me drink my tea. Ah. Alright, alright. Uh first track is called Fudge Funk. It's just pretty much the intro. It's like an instrumental. Um kinda sets the tone of the album, you know. Um it, it kinda is giving like a warm up feel of the next show that's about to come, which is uh Fudge Pudge which is the first single of the album. Then we get into track two, Fudge Pudge. Um, this is the first single of the album. And this was OC's uh, first appearance on Wax because um, it's a braggadocious track, but OC of DITC, but at the time he was part of Organized Confusion because um, like he was like an unofficial member or an affiliate of Organized Confusion. Um, he actually grew up with them, you know, growing up and stuff like that. So that's how that whole um, relationship with them, you know, you know, kind of started and stuff like that. So um, they all did their thing. The song's about like five thirty minutes, five minutes and thirty seconds. Kind of long, especially very long, especially for a single right there. Um, track three, "Walk Into the Sun," which is the third and final single of the album. You know, it's just uh, they, you know, they talk about embracing. The, they talk about embracing the sun, um, the importance of the sun, and just you know, just having, just talk about them having fun in the summertime, uh, and that's what I got from that joint right there. Uh, that's the single, but I don't think there was a video for that. Uh, it's funny because um, that song to me just has like that summer feel to it. You know, like it's a song that you know. It, all my people that lived in New York and back in the, especially back in the day, like you remember, like you know, cats just like you know opening the fire hydrants and stuff like that, and you know, like you know, just you, well, you can't do that no more. I mean, you weren't allowed to do that back then, but we still did it anyways. But um, yeah, those are just good times, man. But I miss those days, man. It's just the way New York is now is just it's not what it used to be. It's just all, it's all like gentrified and you know fucking Disneyland and shit, Disney World and shit, so, but it is what it is, alright, uh, track four, uh, release of Hypnotical Gases, um, pretty dope conceptual track, um, you know, in this song is, in the first verse, you know, um, Farrah Mouse is actually talking about, um, you know, he's, he's talking about, you know, biological warfare and things like that, um, you know, and it's very relevant to today, because, you know, it's just about, you know, 
people putting like pesticides in food and then now foods like you know just about Monsanto GMO and you know things like that um you know it talks about you know he talks about the um you know about the atom bombs and like you know napalm like what we did in the world war um in the vietnam war you know it talks about stuff like that and then like i said before and then later on you know prince paul and then they they eventually get into you know they talk about the ozone layer uh they talk about martial law uh they talk about global warming and you know it's very ahead of its time it, i highly recommend you guys checking that song out because that song applies to today because the shit that they're talking about all that shit's happening right now you know what i mean so very ahead of his time especially for 1991 you know because you, you didn't really hear too many people talk about that because around that time you know at, at that time that was like the black empowerment movement that was like the more like you know with the five percenters and you had groups like public enemy grand nubian x clan like kim shabazz bdp um bunch of other artists um groups at that time you know um spreading that you know the black empowerment movement that there was going on uh so that was a uh, release of hypnotical gases very dope um like the beat for that shit too um track five audience pleasers um it's a lyrical track it, I, I thought it was okay uh i just didn't care for the beat i, I felt like the beat could have been dope um that's just my opinion it's one of the weaker tracks of the album but what made what made um but the lyrics made up for it and that's what i got from that joint uh audience pleases um track six jimenez cricketa uh that's just a skit you know just them um talking um you know joking around over instrumental you know what i mean um it uses the same sample as uh DITC, ditc's uh get yours of their um debut album that came out back in 2000 um the ditc the self-titled album that came out back in 2000 uses that same song um i think it was big l and oc on the track i believe i think those, it was them two on the track so um but yeah it uses that same sample all right uh track seven po on um, prisoners of war that was actually a pretty cool um track right there dope concept you know just pretty much uh you know they they compare the terms as prisoners of war in the vietnam war um what I got from that song was that um, is them not compromising their style to the masses. So he's comparing like how commercial radio and these artists are like trying to compromise the people into that kind of into that world. You know, like where like he's comparing that he's comparing like the commercial world as the Vietnam War and then be as the POW, just trying to like you know trying to save. The people from that and that's what I got from that right there um like I said yeah the commercial he compares commercial commercial rap to the Vietnam War and that's what I got from that job right there but they the, but the way they did it is just so ill and that's what I got from that job right there so that was prisoners of war um track eight uh the rough side of town um you know just talking about them growing up in south side Queens um, I just wish they made a used a better beat for that. You know what I mean? Dope song. I just wish the beat could have been a little bit better. That's just my opinion. I uh, could have um, not I, not that I could have done without. I could have done without the beat. I just feel like with a subject matter like that, I feel like it could have had a better beat with that. But that's just my opinion. Um, that's the rough side of town. Uh, track nine. Um, organized confusion. That's just a braggadocio track. Pretty cool right there. Uh, track 10 PS48 or IS48. Um, it's just a it's a skit over an instrumental, just them joking around and stuff like that. They're in, it, it sounds like they're in school, like in a classroom. They're just joking around and things like that. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, track 11, uh, Roosevelt Franklin. Um, it's sort of like an autobiographical track. But it, it actually talked about this kid named uh, Roosevelt Franklin, where um, you know he's kind of like a good kid, but you know he he sort of has like a temper in a sense where like you know you know he seems like a nerd, but he's a good dude, but he's not your average cat like where you know like you can just push him around and, and like and you expect him not to fight back. He'll, he'll fight back. You know what I'm saying? So, and the reason why I say that is because 
I guess Rose of Franklin would have been fair much because um, um, Prince Paul, he said in the interviews that he was the one out there, you know, just like, you know, doing the drug dealing and things like that. And Farrell Marsh would chill with him. But Farrell Marsh was like kind of like the nerdy kid, the kid that, you know, was into comic books. But, you know, he was still street because just being around, you know, being around Prince Paul and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And like, Kaz would, you know, fuck with him, but then he'll fight back. And then it's just like crazy shit like that. So that's why I say it's more of an autobiographical track. And that's what I got from that drum right there. Um, track 12, uh, Who Sold My Last Piece of Chicken? Uh, this is the remix. Um, that's a single. Um, I believe that's, it's just a remix, so it's not the original. But, um, it's just talking about their, la um, their love for chicken. And it's a pretty funny track, man. They just go in on how much they love chicken. Uh, all, all flavors, which curry chicken, fried chicken, baked chicken, grilled chicken. I mean, this is going, it's, it's actually pretty fun. There was a video for that. I'll post that down in the description box. So, you know, I thought I'd just throw that out there. Um, that's who, who's, who stole my last piece of chicken, the remix. Uh, track 13, Open Your Eyes. Um, one of my favorite tracks off the album. Uh, it's just pretty much talked about, um, talked about how evil this, how his world is, is how wicked it is. Just have, you have to keep your eyes open, watch your back, don't trust a lot of people. Um, just have God in your life, man. Um, just, you know, you know, do you, man. But, you know, learn more, man. Just, like, you know, spread the wealth as far as, like, your knowledge and things like that. And that's what I got from that joint right there. That easily could have been a single, especially around that time. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, they didn't make it a single. But it is what it is. Um, then we got <clears throat> track 14. Uh, it's the intro, which is kind of weird because you would think the intro would be in the beginning of the album, but it's not. It's actually the la the, the second to last track of the album, which I thought was kind of weird. But um, it was just both of them free song to a beat, to an instrumental, you know, things like that. But it would have been nice if they put that as, as the instrumental. I mean, it's the as the first track and then bring in Fudge Funk and then you kind of you kind of like sequence. It, it would it would have sequenced the um the album a lot better, but it, that was the only thing that bothered me. But it, it's not that big of a deal. But you know, it is what it is. And then last but not least, who sold my last piece for chicken, which is the second single of the album, is an original version. Um, it uses a different beat and stuff like that, and it's pretty much the same thing as the remix. They love the chicken. The the lyrics are a little bit different, but it's almost the same. But um, that's pretty much it, guys. Overall, dope album. Very slept on, especially for 1991. Um, yeah, man, this is a great album right here. You know, obviously it's not their best work, but you know, um, you can tell like they were still, you know, they were still what behind it is. But you know, they still carry themselves as if they were been in the game for years. Um, you know, whatever they learned from Paul C, you know, it definitely rubbed off on them and, you know, they, they made it work, you know what I mean? My only gripe with this album is not the production, because I love the production, I thought the production was good, but it was the mixing, um, because with certain songs, you had to kind of like turn up the volume on certain songs and stuff like that, and it, that's not particularly their fault, uh, you know, because, you know, like I said, like, they did the production themselves and they did everything the mixing the production themselves so you know that's what i meant by like them being what behind it is them doing everything themselves and being kind of a novice kind of being like a beginner of doing it but i thought they did a great job but i just thought the mix was kind of like eh, kind of subpar in a sense but i didn't let that affect that me affect me too much but um yeah man um and it's funny too because one thing I forgot to mention with this album is that they were signed under Hollywood Basic and Hollywood Basic is pretty much a record label that was under Disney. Disney, Yes, same Disney, Walt Disney, but uh, Donald Duck, uh, Mickey Mouse, uh, Minnie Mouse, Goof, Goofy, and, and all, all Cinderella and Snow White and all that. Yes, the same record label that was under Disney, alright? So I thought I'd just throw that out there. 
Um, another thing too with this album, my gripe is that um, it's out of print. You know what I mean? Um, it's very hard to come by. Uh, it's very expensive too. Um, I remember buying this. I want to say for fifteen dollars, and I was lucky because usually this album goes for at least twenty dollars. So um, I got it. I, I think I bought it off eBay. I believe. Yeah, I got it for fifteen bucks. So um, I think it was like twelve ninety nine plus tax, and it came to like fifteen dollars. So that was including shipping and handling and stuff like that. So. But yeah, man, so it's long out of print, so if you can find it, I highly recommend you picking it up. You know, if you, even if you see it for 20 bucks, definitely pick it up, you know what I'm saying? Especially if you want to complete your, you know, your Pharaoh Monch, Prince Poe, um, you know, your, your Prince Poe collection and stuff like that. So, but that's it, folks. Hope you guys enjoyed that review. Uh, stay tuned for more. Peace.